a series, The Gifts of the Spirit, for now um, about a month now. So these are, we've got the last two messages uh, this week, and then next week, uh, last two weeks, we uh, talked about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. If you weren't here for those, they're online, they're on our website, they're on YouTube. Um, I even redid part of the first Beth and the Holy Spirit message so that we could have the whole thing online. Uh, so you can you can go and listen to that one. But this morning we wanted to go back to, we started opening with uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And so we're going to go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And we're going to look at this gift of the Spirit that are listed there. And we're going to ask the God to empower us and to be and for our ourselves to be obedient to the Spirit so we can begin to see these gifts of the Spirit in operation in our church body whenever we gather together, whenever we're out on the streets doing whatever we're doing, eating dinner, in our homes, that uh, we would always be full of the Spirit and that His gifts would be in operation within us. So um, let's this morning pray before we open up the Word. Father, we are so grateful to be uh, gathered together this morning. Father, we thank you. We count it a privilege to be called your sons and daughters, to be family represented here today. Father, I pray that your love would continue to inspire us, Father, to be one with each other and one with you. And God, I pray that through your word today, God, that you would encourage us, God, that you would, by your spirit, equip us, Father, to be people that are full of the spirit. God, that these gifts that we read today would not just be uh, words on a page, but Father, they would be something that inspires us to receive more of you. And Father, we know that when we have more of you and your spirit is evident within us, Jesus, you are lifted up and you are glorified. So we pray, God, that you would fill us with your spirit. May we hunger and thirst after the things that you have desired to give us today. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. We're going to open um, in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 this morning. God 
providence. Verse 7. Now to each one the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. So the, the gifts of man, manifestation, maybe that's not a word that we use very often, often, but maybe the demonstration, we can use that word. Now to each one the demonstration of the Spirit, so the evidence of the Spirit is given for the common good. To one there is given through the Spirit a message of wisdom, to another a message of knowledge, by the means of the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another the gift of healing by the same Spirit, to another miraculous powers, to another prophecy, to another distinguishing between spirits, to another speaking in different kinds of tongues, and to still another interpretation of the tongue. All these are the work of one and the same Spirit, and He distributes them to each one just as He determines. So as we go into this, again, this, I, I keep on, while I'm reading it again this morning, I, I keep on emphasizing the, the one. There's one Spirit, there's one Lord, there's one God. It's, it's, it's all the same. So we don't get to get, I, I mentioned this the first time we, we talked about the gift of the Spirit, we don't get to get the gifts of the Spirit and we have, maybe I've got a gift of healing and I can put it on a business card and make myself the gift the, the healer in the, in the room or something like This isn't something that we one-up each other or a title that we earn, but this is from God and God distributes them to us, each one as, as He desires. And so our goal in this as a body, how do we begin to see the gifts of the Spirit, these things listed here, in operation among us. Well, it starts with a desire. Holy Spirit, I desire to be used. Holy Spirit, I'm willing to be used. Today, when I gather together as a family, today when, I'm, when we're gathered on, on a Wednesday night, today when we're gathered at, in the house playing some games or whatever, hey, Holy Spirit, I'm available. If this is a moment that you want to, be used, to use me to show that Jesus is Lord, I'm willing to use it. When I'm walking in the grocery store and I see somebody who is hurt or I see somebody who needs healing and I'm saying to the Spirit, Spirit, no matter what I'm doing, no matter where I'm at, I'm willing to be used. Then he says, it says that that one Spirit, that Lord, that Jesus, that God is going to move us and prompt us as he wills. Because in verse 11 it says that he distributes them, each one, as he determines. So let's look, we're going to look a little closer now at, each, uh, at three of the gifts this morning. Next week we're going to talk about prophecy, and we're going to talk about distinguishing of spirits and speaking another tongue. And this week we're going to focus on faith, healing, and miracles. And so these are three of the gifts the Spirit gives the body to encourage one another, to, for us to become one, and for, again, Jesus to be glorified in the So let's first start with faith. Let's look at um, uh, the, the, famous, the famous faith, faith verse. We're going to go to the book of Hebrews today. The Hebrews is right before it. James comes after Philemon. Or Philemon, depending on your accent. But uh, Philemon. And uh, Hebrews chapter 11. Faith is an important part, and in, in, in this faith that we have, we know um, the faith comes by hearing the message. And so we know each one of us that have put our faith in Jesus, that we've believed upon Jesus, we've received salvation. Not by anything that we've done, right? But by the faith that we have. And so faith here is defined in Hebrews 11, and I love the way it puts it. And I'm going to read from the NIV. I don't know what version you have this morning, but I love these words that it says here. It says, Now faith is a confidence in what we hope for, and the assurance about what we do not see. This is sometimes really hard for us, right, to be a people of faith. Why? Because we, we love to be a people of logic and a people of reason and to have some concrete evidence. And going through college and having to prove things out. You know, it's really hard now. It, it, Jesus asks us that we be people of faith. And it says by the Holy Spirit, right, in First Corinthians, that the Holy Spirit is going to be the one that's going to give us the gift of faith. Let's look at these. In, in the faith chapter here, Hebrews 11, there's multiple aspects where people took things by faith and not by a reason or not by concrete evidence. It says that because faith is, remember, it's a confidence in what we hope for. So we're hoping in the truth that we know about God. And it's an assurance of what we don't see. So even though in the physical it doesn't look like uh, these things may be true, I'm going to believe the truth that I've received about God, right? 
So uh, let's see, uh, these, there's different aspects here. I'm not going to read this whole chapter because there's, if, I would encourage you to go back to later because there's 39 verses full of examples of different people in the Bible and how they said, by faith, I'm going to believe what God says over what my circumstances, circumstances say. I want to choose to take what He says over maybe what my desires are. I'm going to choose what He says even over what other people around me may be saying or maybe what the evidence says. And this comes only by hearing the truth, knowing the truth, clinging to it. And we're going to see that um, as we, when we look at Romans in a little bit. But it says here, we're going to look at verse 3. The first act of, uh, one of the basic acts of faith it says, by faith we understand that the universe was formed at God's command, so that we what we what is seen was not made out of what was visible. So by faith we believe God is the creator. He created all these things. He spoke it into existence. And so by faith we say, yes, you, we can't understand everything that is, is here in the natural. We can't fully explain it all. There's a lot of good uh, good theories, but we're going to say, by faith we believe that God is the one that spoke these things into existence. Noah was a man that lived by faith. Noah is an Old Testament story. He was a, a man of God, a man that God found favor, and there was a, the nation around him was wicked, and the people were wicked, and, and God had searched the land and found favor with Noah, and he told Noah to build a boat. And right, we got, maybe you guys know, he built a boat, and he had all the animals came, and there was a flood. Well, there's this really significant thing Prior to this, in the biblical history, there was no rain. And so Noah, by faith, he heard, heard from God. He, the, the word of God was, was spoken to him. Hey, there's going to be a flood. It's going to come in 40 days. It's going to come. And these are the preparations that he needed to make for this flood. And Noah, you know, it would be, it'd be like saying, this is totally unbiblical, but say like there were UFOs coming, and I would have never seen a UFO, no, never seen something crazy like that before. Somebody says there's going to be something like water that's going to fall from the sky, and you've never seen it before, Noah, but it's going to come and it's going to flood everything, so you need to prepare. And Noah said, because he had confidence, what he had heard was from God. Right. right. He had faith. He said, what I heard is from God. I know it is Him. I'm going to build this boat. And he became ridiculed, the town made fun of him, people around him. And he said, what are you doing? You're crazy. And he told him, he said, man, it's coming. The judgment of God is coming. But I'm, I'm going to continue to build the boat because I know what I've heard from God. I have faith in what God is saying. So he built the boat. And the flood came. And it says in verse 7, by faith, no, by faith Noah, when warned about things not yet seen, in holy fear built an ark to save his family. By his faith, he con condemned the world, and because it became an heir of righteousness that is in keeping with faith. And so Noah, I love this, that he, that he says, in holy fear. He didn't fear the, um, the natural, the, he didn't fear what other people would think, he didn't fear um, the opinions of others. He said, I'm going to fear in what I've heard from the God, and I'm going to act in accordance with me. I'm going to live by faith. And, and we know the, the story came and his family and the animals survived and now all of us can be descendants of, of Noah and his family. So and then uh, the next the next one here is is Abraham and if we've been studying the Bible or if you've been maybe around a church before maybe you've heard of Abraham but he was a, a man of faith and when God told him God called him to a place that he didn't know and so again Abraham and this is going to, you can follow the story a little bit in verse 8. But Abraham was a man that, that he had heard from God, and God said to go. And it didn't give him any instruction. He said go. And so on faith he said, I know I've heard from God. I know that he is the one that has spoken to me. I'm going to start walking. It took some, there was yeah. some circumstances that weren't quite in order yet. He, he wasn't sure. But I don't know if it's going to be good for me. I don't know if if the if it's going to continue to prosper like I have. I've got everything secure right now. Everything seems okay. And God said, "Go." And He said, "By faith, I'm, I'm going to go. I want to follow what the Lord is telling me." Not only that, then Abraham and his and his wife were promised a child. They were they were without without child, right? And then the Lord asks to Abraham. He gets the, the, they get their child. I mean, Rachel and I, when we get our first adopted child, I can't, 
can't imagine this, this scenario playing out. Rachel and I have been married for 10 years, waiting on our, our first uh, adopted child. And, and so Abraham gets his first child, and then God says, offer the child to me. He, gets, he finally gets a promise. He's been waiting for I'm like waiting for this promise. And then he says, no, offer this child to me. And by faith, he said, I know there's a, there, there's a God that's going to rescue. There's a God that has a purpose for this. I want to be obedient to his word, even though in my mind, it doesn't quite make sense. And that's, that's a, this faith aspect is, is something that's, that's sometimes so hard for us to get. But once we get it, we receive the better. And we're going to show, we're going to show you that in, in, a, in Hebrews 11. God usually, God has, usually he has something better for us. But our requirement is we're going to receive it by faith. We're going to say, I'm going to stick to what you're saying above anything else around me, right? So, um, so Abraham, or Abraham, right, in verse 17, it goes over this story. Uh, God, is, God asks him to sacrifice the child, and, and the moment he's about to sacrifice the child, what happens? An angel of the Lord comes, right, and says, hold up! Abraham, wait, see, oh, whoa. Abraham, you're a man of faith. You're about to plunge that knife into your son. I mean, hold up! There's a sacrifice available. There's a ram who was caught in the thicket. He's turn, and there's a sacrifice for him. So now, and God says, and now I know you're a man of faith. You will obey my word. You're going to stick to my word above everything else. The man of faith. So I love this. If you continue to read, you can go through each one of these stories here. It's a little snippet of, of stories throughout the, throughout the Old Testament. But let's look now down to thir verse 39. So the people of faith, they, they said, man, I want to believe God's word. I want to follow God's command over anything else. It says in verse 39, these, these were all commended, all those different people that they just talked about. These were all commended for their faith, yet none of them received what they had been promised, since God had planned something better for us, so that only together with us would they be made perfect. So, so they had they had what they had in mind. They said, "Okay, God, I believe you in faith that this is going to happen." They had this in mind, and they said, "Okay, I'm going to go for that. I'm going to live by faith. I'm going to follow that. I'm going to go after what you have for me." But then he says, "But they didn't quite receive that. Actually, what they received was better than that. They received a, a greater thing because they said, by faith, I want to follow you.' And what they what God had for them was actually better than what He had promised them." Abraham, a father of many nations. Many, many nations. Even today we can say, wow, we are we receive a blessing today because of Abraham's obedience then. That's right. That Jesus was born, he's born through the lineage of Abraham. We are blessed today. We're blessed to be a blessing because Jesus now has given us something better than what was originally promised, what originally thought of. So this is what faith is about. Faith is about stepping out. It's about believing what God has said over any other thing. And so in, um, in Romans chapter 10, verse 17, it says this, that consequently faith comes from hearing the word, hearing the message, hearing the truth. So let's turn there. Romans chapter 10. And we're going to go to verse 17. It says, consequently, so, that, so for the 16, it says, not all the Israelites accepted the good news. For Isaiah says, the Lord who has believed, the Lord who has believed our message. Consequently, faith comes from hearing the message. And the message is heard through the word about Christ. And so how do we build our faith? How do we build up the confidence? How do we build up our faith knowing who God is, and have, being able to put our trust in there, even though we don't see it, we're going to put our trust in the in, in the Word of God. It's by hearing the truth of God. It's about coming, hearing the message of God on Sunday. This is why we preach on Sunday morning. It's not just because I like to talk, though I'm guilty of that too. But uh, a Sunday morning is, hey, we're going to come together as a family. We're going to hear the Word of God, and it's going to increase our faith. It's going to encourage us. It's going to remind us of the truth. And we're going to be able to put our confidence in what God is saying, right? And then, and then on Wednesday night, I'm going to come. I'm going to gather around the Word in my daily life. I'm going to read the Word of God. I'm going to be listening to the Word of God because I want my faith to be built up. Because if I hear the Word, then I believe the Word. If I hear the truth, then I'm going to believe the truth, right? I'm going to have faith. 
Because this is what happens. The warning here, we're going to, if you can read, you can read through that. The warning goes on to um, Romans chapter 11, one page over. Romans chapter 11, verse 11. So this, the question here that, the, um, that Paul is addressing is, hey, if, if faith comes by hearing, then why, did, why did some of the Israelites, they heard the message, but they didn't believe? And so, um, Romans chapter 11, starting in verse 11, it tells us a warning. So here's the warning. In verse 11, Again I ask, did they stumble so as to fall beyond recovery? So did the Israelites, they not listen to, to the message enough that they stumbled beyond recovery? No, not at all. Uh, and that's for each one of us this morning. Is there ever a point that we've stumbled beyond recovery? If we've stumbled beyond faith? No. There's never, there's never a point that we can stumble beyond faith or stumble beyond being rescued. Rather, because of their transgression, salvation has come to the Gentiles to make Israel envious. But if their transgressions means riches for the world, their loss means riches for the, for the Gentiles. How much greater riches were their full inclusion bring? How does this deal with faith? And the warning that we have to us. What, if the, is, is, what it's saying here is if Israelites would have put their full faith in who Jesus was, there would have been a great, the, the blessing would be exponential. But for those that chose not to put their faith fully in who Jesus was, those who decide not to live by faith, they miss out on receiving what God has for them. And so, as a, man, when I think about this, this list of gifts that the Spirit gives, I said, man, I want to be, I want our church to be a people of faith. Right? Because I, we don't want to miss out on what God has for us. I don't want to miss out on my family. I don't want Rachel and I to miss out if I choose to, to lean on myself instead of leaning on, on faith and what God has said. Man, I don't want to miss out on what God has. I don't want as a church body for us to miss out on what God has because I think God has something better for us. If we're going to believe what He says over anything that we can think of ourselves, right? thinking about faith. What kind of things, what kind of thing can we believe in in faith? Man, I believe for a, 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 I could believe for a child myself. I, I, that's what I believe. I said, God has promised to me that, that, uh, that I'll have a child. Man, I want to believe that. I want to believe by faith. No matter what's looking around around me, I, I, I'm believing in faith. God's going to provide for that for me. Man, when we think about the church family, I believe, man, this room is full of people that is loving Jesus and making disciples and hunger, hungering and thirsting after him. And the gifts of the Spirit are evident in their life. And I, I believe that by faith because I know that the harvest is plentiful and the labors are few. And the more that we increase, there's going to be more that come in. So I, I believe that in faith. I believe in faith, right, that we're going to have a, a full worship team. I believe in faith that each one of us will have jobs that's going to provide for our families, that it's going to increase uh, our ability to influence others. I believe this by faith it's going to happen. So how do we, uh, how does this, um, going back to 1 Corinthians chapter 12, it says that, that faith is a gift of the Spirit. How does this work when we're coming together as a body? And I, I don't know about you guys, there's been, there's been different circumstances um, in, in my life when I'm gathered with the people and we're believing for something, and you know, things around us look dim. And then there's, you, there's somebody in the room, usually, that will be, remind, that will be reminded of a scripture and says, no, wait a second, it may look, it may look terrible, there's something we talk about the rivers of living water. There's something within me that says, no, wait, uh, this is what's true. This is what God is going to do. Let's believe, guys. And there's that, that maybe uh, a cheerleader type atmosphere. That come, and somebody says, no, I, I'm going to believe. It may look dim around me, but I'm going to believe. And this is the Spirit gifting that moment of faith. And it encouraged the body. Man, it's like, yeah, man, if, if David can believe for that, man, let's all believe for that. Because of the gift of faith that God's given him, that man, no matter what, God's going to bless this house, and I, I believe it. I don't know if you guys don't believe it, but David's going to believe it. And he's, that's a gift of faith that's been given to him, and so we can all rally around. And so God uses these gifts for us to rally around and say, yeah, I, 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 if David can believe, I can believe for that too. And so that's how the gift, the gift of faith operates. God, the Spirit of God gives somebody with a, a faith that doesn't look ordinary. He, it was a belief, I'm going to believe God above every other situation. And so then we, as a body, we're encouraged, yeah, I see that. I, I can believe that too. If you can believe that, I can believe that. Mm -hmm. 
right? And together, it lifts up the body. And then when we see it come, come to pass, man, Jesus is lifted up. Jesus is glorified. Jesus is really awesome, right? Because faith comes by the truth. I believe in the truth. And if we believe on the truth, it's going to happen. All right. We've got the gift of faith. Second, uh, second gift that we're going to go over today um, is the gift of healing. And I'll say this a million times, healing is for today. If you've never heard it before, it's for today. We know Jesus, uh, if you look at the New Testament, the, there's Gospels, right? Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And the four books, there's, there's the story of Jesus. And the story of Jesus is really awesome because I see him and I'm like, I, I want to live like that. I want that, I want his life to be my life, right? Like Jesus is like walking around and he's, just, he's healing the sick. He's preaching. He's raising up dead people. Lepers are getting healed. Blind people are getting healed. I mean, like, this is, this is a regular occurrence in his life. Uh, I, report, I I found, um, I was looking at a couple different stories, some of them maybe overlapping, but about 31 different healing stories of Jesus. But this is a cool, this is a cool part. Let's turn to Luke. Luke chapter 9. Because if it was, if Jesus was just going around healing people and, you know, everything, and I would be, I'd be super encouraged because I was, wow, that's my God, that's that's Jesus. He's really amazing. He's awesome. But this really neat thing begins to happen as Jesus is with his disciples, right? Because it wasn't just about Jesus doing the cool stuff. It wasn't just about Jesus demonstrating his power so that we could sit here today and, and marvel at Jesus, which we do. Jesus is pretty awesome. Right. But then in Luke chapter ten, and there's a couple other uh, other passages that it begins to be transferred. Not just Jesus doing the awesome work, but now his people, his followers, begin to do these awesome, amazing things, these healings. So in Luke chapter 10, Jesus is about to send out the 72. He, he has his 12 disciples that are really close to him, right? He has other disciples that are, that are following him. He has a crowd that usually goes with them, right? So there's 72 of these sold-out Jesus freaks walking around Israel. And Jesus does... Jesus... Um, in, Verse 1 in chapter 10, he says, After this, the Lord appointed 72 others and sent them two by two ahead of him to every town and place where he was about to go. So he, so, this is so good. He's 72, two by two, it goes ahead of him to the place that he's about to go. I don't know, we talked about going, we're going to do the neighborhood blitz in, a, in two weekends on the 17th. I want to encourage you with everything within me. If not for me, for Jesus, I don't know how else, to, I, I don't want to manipulate it. You should be here on the 17th. Because it's going to be an important night of not just, we're going to go invite everybody to come. But we're going to go before God, and we're going to allow God to come into our neighborhood. And I believe, like, this, this is what's going to be happening. We're, we're pointing us to go to the neighborhood, we're going to be knocking on doors, inviting them to come on Sunday morning. We're going to ask if we can pray for them for any, any needs that they may have. But we're going before to prepare what God's going to do in this neighborhood, all right? I'm just, this little exciting, this is what's going to happen. Because why? In verse 2, this is what's going on. This is why Jesus, Jesus says this. Jesus is one, one, he's only one, right? Jesus. But he says, he told them in verse 2, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. We need some help. Jesus is like, I got some reinforcements. He has a master plan here. He says, you guys... Everybody in this room, all those that call Jesus their Savior, right? We're his reinforcement, we're his workers. We're, we need to do this stuff with him. He says, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into the harvest field. Go, I am sending you. Yeah. I'm sending you. I'm, he's sending us. He's sending us to our family, to our neighborhoods, to our workplace, to the city. Go, I'm sending you. And it says, out like lambs among wolves. Do not take a purse or a bag or sandals and do not greet anyone on the road. So he goes on here and he gives some instructions. Don't take anything with you. And, and I would say the same thing with us. We don't, we're not taking anything with us. We're not, being, uh, we're not bringing anything impressive. We're not impressive. We're, we don't want to be the ones that attract people to Catholic City Church. We don't want to be the ones that attract people to Jesus, right? We want Jesus in us. He said, don't take anything with you. Just go. 
It, it goes on and tells them a little bit more instructions. When you go, if somebody welcomes you, talk to them. And that's what we're going to do. We're going to go around the neighborhood. If somebody talks to us, great. We're going to talk back to them. We're going to show, show them a little bit of Jesus. And here's verse 9. Uh, verse 8 and 9. is when you enter a town and are welcome, eat what is offered to you. So if somebody says hello to me, I'm going to say hello to them. If somebody is kind of foul to me at the door, I'll just say, well, thank you. If you have any need, you know, we're right down the street. But if they stay and, and talk for a little while, they're a little friendly. Yeah. I'm going to talk. Why? Because it says in verse 9, then it gives us this opportunity. He says this to his followers. He doesn't say this is just what I'm going to do. You guys go tell them that I'm coming, so then I'm going to come heal. He says this Heal the sick who are there and tell them the kingdom of God has come near to you. So go, prepare ahead of time. If people welcome you, talk to them. Eat their food if they want to offer you some food. And heal the sick. Because the kingdom of God is been near you. This is good news. This is good news. That, hey, there's healing provided, not just by Jesus and his cool stories, but he says, now you are, go out and you're going to heal the sick. Yeah. This is the authority that we have been given to us right. through Jesus. And what's really neat here, Isaiah 53, verse 5, says it's by his stripes that we are healed. And we know that that happens, that he dies on the cross and he rises again, right? That that prophecy is complete. Completed. But this is even before the work of the cross. So, so the so the miracles and, and healings should be a regular part of our life. Yeah. This is like this is unquestionable. This, if we're followers of Jesus, we can heal people. Mm -hmm. James chapter. Oh. What's up? I should get you excited. And, uh, it gets me excited. <laughs> <laughs> right. James chapter five, verse thirteen. James 5, verse 13 says, The prayer of faith will make them well. So it kind of correlates with the other thing, right? We're going to believe that this is true. We're going to believe that healing is for today. And when we pray for people, we're going to believe God wants to answer it. And it's going to happen. Yes. We have faith. Amen. We have faith that healing is for today. And because in Matthew 28, Jesus also says, right before he goes into heaven, he's talking to, to all the believers. He says that uh, they're going to go and be disciples. And he says this. He says, all authority in heaven has been given to me. Amen. Jesus. He has a lot of authority. Yeah. But the next part is really neat, right? Mm -hmm. Linda knows what's that, right? Because the next part is, all authority in heaven has been given to me. I'm giving you the same authority that I have to go heal the sick, to go proclaim the truth, to go make disciples. Healing the sick. So this is a gift of the Holy Spirit. So how do we start seeing this gift in operation? I think one, start praying for people. I know somebody's sick next door, I'm mean, gonna pray for them. If I see somebody limping, I'm gonna pray for them. Maybe I need more, I'm gonna pray for them. I'm gonna, I'm gonna make every effort because I know God can do this. But secondly, it's gonna require us to listen. Because sometimes the Holy Spirit is gonna prompt us to pray. And I believe as we just step out in faith, as we step out, hey, God, I know that you're going to heal. I'm just going to start praying for people to, to, for healing. Then I, I think we're going to develop this, that we're going to be able to listen to the Spirit. It's, it's going to be more Spirit-directed than just Andrew going out and praying and laying hands on people. But as, in that operation of just going out and praying for people, we're going to learn how to walk with the Spirit, how, yes. where it's the Spirit that's going to show us these things. I remember the first time I ever experienced um, healing, is that God healed somebody through my prayer. When I was nine years old, I went on a mission trip, and we're at, we're um, on a on a small town, and it had a church building. We had a we had a, just done like a crusade preaching, and people were down at the altars praying and asking God. I remember as a as a little nine year old boy, you don't have to be old in the faith; you, you can be just new in the faith, right? I, I felt prompted. There was a gentleman that was kneeling at the, the right side of the stage, and he he was laying there praying. And I felt prompted. I felt within me, like a, a water within me. How do, how do you know what's a spirit? I, I don't know how to describe it. The Bible maybe isn't clear on the description of how it works. But I know there's an inner prompting in me that says, I need to pray for that gentleman. So I said, okay, I'm going to go up. I'm going to lay my hands on the gentleman. So as I'm laying on my hand on the gentleman, we're, we're going to talk about this next week, a word of wisdom. But I felt the, the spirit, just like a prompting, pray for his back specifically. I said, okay, I'm going to pray for his back. 
and he spoke Spanish. I didn't speak any Spanish. I'm just praying. And I said, God, I don't know uh, what, what is the problem or anything. God, I just ask that you bless him. And then I felt that prompting. The Spirit said, pray for his back. I said, and God, I just pray for his back. I pray that you would heal his back. And I remember praying that um, he would be, I remember praying that if he missed any work, that he would be able to return back to work and that, and that his back would be whole. There'd be no more pain. My little nine-year-old friend, that was it. Wow. Right? Wow. And then later that evening, we got a knock on our hotel door, and the interpreter had come and asked, hey, did Andy pray for this gentleman at, um, at this evening at church? And so and Dad asked me over, and did you? And I'm like, yeah, I prayed for him. And, and I prayed for him. He had been out of work for six months because of a back injury and hadn't been able to work and provide for his family. And that night, God took all of his pain away, and he was able to go back to work. Hallelujah. So these gifts of the Spirit, they're in operation. If we if we simply have this, we have a desire. I want to be used, Holy Spirit, and, and He uses them. If we're obedient, I, I know that God. I know the truth. I know the truth says that You want us to be able to heal the sick. So I'm going to begin to pray for the sick out of obedience to Your Word. And then He begins to do the work. And the gift of the Spirit is the prompting. The Spirit will prompt us. Pray for this. I tell you all, I tell you all sorts of fun stories. The only requirements, when we talk about the only, what is the requirements for, for being used by the, the, in the gifts of the Spirit, is that we say we're willing. I desire to be. I desire this in my life. When we do, we, got, we start seeing gifts of faith, operation, Gives of healing, and the third one, miraculous powers. So there's no question if we look at the story of Jesus that miraculous powers were evident in his life. So I don't know if raising the dead if that falls under healing or that under, falls under miraculous powers. You know, I don't know. There wasn't a there's a category in the New Testament of like, okay, this is these, these, these are miracles, these, these are, are healed, but I think raising the dead is a pretty, pretty miraculous thing. Right? That's, kind of, that's, kind of, that's kind of a neat thing. I love this verse, and you guys have heard me share it many times in Paul's prayer for the Ephesian church in uh, Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20, the church in Ephesus. Paul ends his prayer, this is just amazing set of words, and I love thinking about it. But he says, he prays, he says, to the one who is able to do above and beyond anything we can hope or imagine. And I think I've, I've encouraged you guys before on this, but, you know, that beyond what I could hope or imagine, you know, and I even, you know, tell myself a little bit, I was a Barney child, I, had a, I have a really good imagination. <laughs> uh, above and beyond anything we can hope or imagine. That's the ability that our God has. Amen. In Galatians chapter 5, let's turn there. It talks about this, the, the greatest miracle of all. We sit, uh, you know, I open saying that, you know, healing, uh, raising the dead, I don't know where that comes as far as miracles, but this is, this is a, this is a true miracle. It's a gift of salvation. Yes. Yeah. Salvation is the biggest miracle yes. that we have. Yes. Galatians chapter 5, we're going to read verses this time. So again, I ask, does God give you the Spirit and work miracles among you by the works of the law or by believing what you heard? We've been talking specifically about salvation. Does, does salvation come to us? This miraculous thing where we, we were once dead, but we've been made alive in, in Christ. 
that we were once uh, heading towards a penalty of sin is death, but we now have received the gift of life. He says, have we received this? Has it been given to us by the, by the Spirit? And has the works of miracles come? Has it come by obeying law, by doing work? Or has it come by believing what we have heard? And it's, by, it's by faith. It's a miracle of salvation, and it comes by faith. So miraculous powers, we're going to see many people come to faith as the gift of the Spirit is in operation in our lives. Because John, here's another example of these miraculous powers that Jesus has. In John chapter 2, this may be one of the, one of the talked about um, miracles that Jesus did, but his first miracle, turning water into wine in John chapter 2. There's so much significance into this, and we're going to be doing a series um, later, and it, we might be including this this miracle of Jesus because it talks so much. Uh, there's so much more than just a wedding that that Jesus attends. It's so much more than just turning water into wine. There's so many symbolism that goes into there. But for for this moment, in talking about the miraculous powers, when Jesus does something, he does something better, as we've already covered for for healings and in faith. But he does it the best. And so when we're talking about miracles, these things that that are out of the ordinary that that we want to see, that the Spirit wants to do in our lives, they're not just ordinary, they're not just, you know, He's going to do something um, that, that's evident to us, but it's going to do something that's better than what we can imagine Him doing in every situation. And so the gift of the Spirit, the gift of the Spirit, specifically about miracles, is that we can believe that this, when the Spirit does something, that it's going to be miraculous, it's going to be better than anything we could hope or anything we could imagine. We know in like Matthew 17, there's he did great things like fish, uh, a coin in a fish mouth, or Matthew 19. Um, he says that, the, the, that salvation specifically, again, is something that is impossible. So let's look at that in Matthew 19. So I believe this is a miracle that, that Jesus wants to perform over and over in our midst and in our lives. So Matthew 19. Miracle described as something that's impossible in the ordinary. Matthew 19, verse 16. says this, Just that a man came up to Jesus and asked, Teacher, what good thing must I do to get eternal life? Remember the Galatians passage I struggled to find, but Galatians chapter, uh, chapter 3 was that, that this miracle is salvation. It comes not by works, but by faith. So here, here's a man, he comes to Jesus and says, Teacher, what good thing must I do to have eternal life? Again, he already started off on a, on a bad foot. It's not a good thing. There's no works that he could do to accomplish or to receive eternal life. But Jesus responds, Why do you ask me about what is good? Jesus replied, There is only one who is good. If you want to enter life, keep the commandments. Which ones, he inquired. Jesus replied, you shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not give false testimony. Honor your mother and father, and love your neighbor as yourself. He says, all these things I have kept, the young man said. What do I still lack? Jesus answered, if you want to be perfect, go and sell all your possessions and give to the poor, and you will have treasures in heaven. Then come, follow me. When the young man heard this, he went away sad, because he had great wealth. This is the important aspect here is not Jesus isn't telling us all to go sell everything and not to come forth. But what Jesus is getting at is this young man, he had followed all these decrees and, and, and followed all the commands, but in his heart he had still reverent his wealth greater than um, his following Jesus. So Jesus went to his heart and said, Hey, there's still one problem. You still don't depend, you're still not willing to depend fully on me. There's a position in his heart that his wealth take taking over the position of Jesus. So then 23, then Jesus said to his disciples, Truly I tell you, it is hard for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of heaven. Again I tell you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of the needle than for somebody who is rich to enter the kingdom of heaven. Then verse 25, when the disciples heard this, they were greatly astonished and asked, Who then can be saved? They're like, Jesus, this sounds impossible. If, 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 if we've got to sell everything, then man, this, this, nobody's going to get saved, Jesus. This is terrible. Simply, he's talking about this idol. Wherever somebody puts something, 
wealth or any, anything above Jesus. It's, a, it's an idol. It's something that needs to be taken down. Jesus says this. Love. Jesus looked at them and said, With man, this is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. Again, alluding to this great miracle of salvation. That in the natural, it's impossible. Why would somebody choose Jesus over what they're uh, over the natural things of their heart? Why would somebody choose to follow follow him over what what pleases them and, and the the things that they they find themselves sin? How is this possible? How can Jesus take a place in somebody's heart over every material thing, over every family thing, over every work thing, over everything? How is this possible? It's possible because. Jesus, with Jesus, all things are possible. He can get to the hardest heart. He can get to the, the most difficult situation. He can get to all things and turn it all around. It's Jesus. He's able to do these things. He's able to do the impossible. So again, if we want to see the gifts of the Spirit in operation, the gift of faith, the gift of healing, and the gift of miracles in operation, we've got to continue to be a people that stand and say, I want to believe the truth over every ordinary thing in our lives. Or every circumstance that surrounds me, I want to believe it. I want to desire Him to use me. So in closing, I want to go over how can we get the gifts? If the Holy Spirit, let's turn back here to 1 Corinthians. There's all sorts of different kinds of gifts. And they're all given to us so that Jesus is glorified. Sitting this morning, there's three gifts that, that the Spirit was highlighting. The gift of faith, the gift of healing, the gift of miracles. So how is it that we're going to start seeing these things in operation? In our lives, in our family, as we gather, in our workplace? They're going to require two things for us. They're going to require one for us to listen in faith. Listen with anticipation. Listen with an exhortation. Jesus, you're going to do this. So whenever we come together on Sunday morning, man, Holy Spirit, if you desire to use me, speak to me. I want to, I want to be the person that gives, 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 gives the faith to the body this morning. Holy Spirit, if you want to use me, I want to, I want to use the gift of healing to, to encourage the body this morning. God, Holy Spirit, if you want to use me, and I'm listening, I'm, I'm, I'm expecting to be used by you this morning to, to do miracles. Man, I desire this. I want to listen with faith. Listen with anticipation. Listen with that Holy Spirit. I'm ready. I'm ready. I, I, I desire these things. If you read the rest, the whole chapter of 12, Paul says it three times. Desire the gifts. So we're going to listen with desire. And the second part is, is just as easy, but maybe sometimes more intimidating, is to be obedient to the Spirit. <laughs> So one we say, Holy Spirit, I want it, I want you to use me. Holy Spirit, I want these gifts to be in operation. Holy Spirit, you know, heal the sick. Holy Spirit, uh, do this miracle. Holy Spirit, give me faith. And then and then he says, Okay, Andrew, pray for a living today. And then that moment, in that moment, that's the way sometimes it's like a disconnect. Okay, the Holy Spirit's like, Yeah, I want to use you guys. I want to give it to you guys. I want it to be in operation. So he's speaking and he's telling us, oh, go do this, go to this, go say this. And then it starts with us. It's like, all right, here's the ball. What are you going to do with it? And this is what hinders, this is what hinders and so sort of stops the spirit. It's not him. He's, he wants to do it. He wants the miracles. He wants the healing. He wants to see people saved. He wants the miracles, right? He, it's now on us. So we, we got this. And he's telling us to do something. And then our responsibility now, be obedient. I'm going to step out. I'm going to do something different. Okay, Holy Spirit, I want to trust that it's you. I want to tell you, it's you that just told me this. It's you that just told me to pray. It's you that just said to do this. Be obedient. And then we begin to see the gifts and operation. We see our body come together. We see Jesus get risen high. And then when, when everybody around us and our family and everybody and see we see Jesus really good, it, man, we begin to come together, become stronger, love is fulfilled in us. Man, things begin to change. We get to experience God because we are all obedient. We're all expecting and listening. And it's good. It's good life. Amen. It's good life. 
then we don't just have to read about these stories when we come in on Sunday morning. We've got, we got a story, we've got something God's doing. We need to encourage one another. Man, God did this this week. Man, God spoke to me this way. Man, and, you know, I was talking to my neighbor and, and they were sick and I just decided, you know, hey, I want to pray because the Spirit prompted me to pray and I prayed. Or, hey, yesterday David went down to the Union and, uh, and he felt prompted by the Spirit to go down to the Union and saw all of his old buddies from last year that aren't believers. He got to watch the game with them and encourage them. Man, it's, it's exciting. It's going to be an exciting moment. Be encouraged, right? Let's stand this morning. But we can have mom, mom before, okay? But we're we're gonna stand. I want you to stand. If you say, "Man, Andrew, this morning, I want this. I want this." If you say, "Man, I want this," I want you to stand with me. I, I want this. I I want this in my life. And that's what we're gonna probably end next week like that too. I want this in my life. Yeah. I want healing. I don't. I don't like sickness. I don't like it when people are broken. I don't like it when people are experiencing the effects of sin in their life. I don't like it. God doesn't like it. He doesn't want it. He doesn't want it to be destruction around. He doesn't want it depression around us. He doesn't want. He doesn't want this. What he wants to do is give us something better.